Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Clinton Ferguson. I'm the chair of Think Local at Personal, but I'm also a, a disabled uh, uh, individual who draws on care and support and also an unpaid carer for uh, my mother who has Parkinson's and COPD. Uh, so I'd like to get straight into it and try and... Um, how many of you have heard of the term intersectionality and what it means? I just want to talk about uh, the term. The term intersectionality was coined um, by Kimberly Cranshaw, uh, who was a legal scholar in the civil rights uh, uh, movement and advocate. And she introduced uh, the concept in 1989 in a paper titled Demarginalising uh, of Intersection of Race and Sex and Black Feminist um, Criteria of Anti-Discrimination and Feminist Theory. So how, how her work has expanded in a space of intersectionality, looking at uh, more protected characteristics and the interrelation and interplay in that. But what does this mean and how I would describe it? I think of intersectionality as a mosaic and each piece of a mosaic represents a different aspect of a person's identity or experience in within our uh, uh, practice, but also recognising we have to um, Tailoring tailor care and support to the individual's background and identity. I think hand in hand with that, Clinton, is something that we've just mentioned, which is about the lack of data. So you can't possibly start to develop good services until you understand the scope and breadth and depth and dimensions of a problem. And so is is the first one of the first steps to understand um, numbers the exact issues that have been experiences uh, that have been experienced and then to start to hammer down into the intersectional issues and how they are having impacts on individuals and communities. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but also we need to look at uh, how clean is the data. And what I mean by that uh, mm -hmm. data that we have in society um, now has a bias within the data. So what we're collecting, we don't necessarily ask those, those questions. So what assumptions are we forming that has issues for people who uh, have the intersectionality, but also the issues around and the challenges around ageing without uh, children? I'd be really interested from the perspective of Jason uh, on, on your thoughts uh, on that. Yeah, this is, as Kirsty said at the, in, in the introduction, um, this has been one of the big issues. It's good to see Robbins in the chat, who, who's sort of the guru on, on single men or on men and, and not just single men, but men. Um, and also just with, we know the numbers of older single men are growing. So these things become an issue. But there's been, we've written through, you'll see on the AWOC website and also in Robbins writing and some of the academics, if you're not counted, you don't count kind of thing. And that's, that's one of the big challenges. Um, here and now we are seeing it, it it becoming a bigger issue in census and ONS and that's partly because of Kirsty and others pushing for the last um, number of years and that it is now people are being counted but then you have to count within and what are these issues with, that are compounded when when there is this intersection of different um, identities or different um, equalities issues which we pay attention to attention to in theory but in practice and in policy make terms it's only now in the last few years that this issue of aging without children has become seen as a real issue by people outside of the group who actually is aging without children. And, and I think the number that's quoted now is 1.5 million, but by 2030, we expect 2 million. And this is a significant number of, of older people. And, and to be able to do something about it, we do need to understand what that, what that is and what that will look like for, for different groups within. Um, I think there was a recent, I don't I think Kirsty put it in, but also like 80% of um, older single 
aging without people with disabilities, it will increase by ex expected by the next census to that number should just that one group would increase by 80 percent, um, which is great that people with disabilities are living longer, but there are more challenges um, if there aren't these um, people to support and also if policymakers are just looking at one part of a person, not the whole part of the person. And, and I think linked to that is, uh, as it's been mentioned in the chat, is it can be a struggle locally to even get service providers to even consider that there are older LGBTQ plus people. So if that's the starting point, we're already kind of a disadvantage there because we haven't really thought about the issues that are affecting people now, let alone how things are going to develop. Um, I guess, is there a role here? If we're thinking to, if we're going to be moving on now to think about what can we do in the short term, medium term and long term um, to kind of think about some of these issues that we're talking about um, to get a more personalised care? What do we think about this idea about raising awareness? But what is the role, I guess, that advocacy has and then link to that co-production? Fenton. Uh, uh, um, thank you. For me, short term, um, awareness and uh, engagement. Um, so it's about how we raise these issues and challenges, how we um, enable uh, diverse backgrounds within Aging Without Children uh, and tailor that engagement efforts to resonate with the unique identities. This could include launching targeted awareness campaigns that consider the intersectionality of ageing without uh, children. But also, in short term, I think someone in the chat mentioned, for me, self, how do we use self-directed support and care and support for uplifting uh, uh, people with ageing without children uh, and tailoring it for an individual with uh, using self-directed support options immediately? This allows them to make choices that align with their intersectional uh, identity, providing agency in their own care and support decisions. But also for me, what might this mean for policy sh short term in housing? You know, how do we elevate and, and look at uh, housing policy to make them more inclusive? This, uh, to me, uh, involves considering how intersectional uh, identities impact on housing needs and ensuring access to cultural sensitivity, housing options, because in the short term, we need to think about aging without children. There are cultural norms and societal uh, norms, but they are disconnected, especially around uh, the uh, the challenging areas of ageing without children and intersectionality. Thank you, Clinton. Um, Jason, did you want to add to that? And then I'll start to feed back some of the thoughts from the... Yeah, I would, um, yeah, I would agree with what Clinton said, but I think, uh, and I, but also I would say in practical terms, there is also, there's a number of groups around the country and, and especially I see Sue, Sue and Anne here from New York, they've been going for like 10 years almost now or longer. Um, and and so they have been talking about these issues and there are groups of people with lived experience who who know what this looks like and, and, and in different, um, from different perspectives. Um, but also we have tended as because we we're an unfunded sort of charity and it's gone and stops and starts sort of thing it it, it it it's we thought of been trying to think more about it from a policy perspective and and supporting the local groups but also trying to link those things in because that it's that lived experience that's going to tell us the most but um but it's it, yeah it's it, it's a there's huge challenges but there are some some ways of getting through this is where peers talk to peers but also well what are some solutions and rather than it just being this huge big issue how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time kind of thing I guess it's it's some of that kind of thing is incrementally trying to support some of these things because some when it's great to see some commissioners on the call and I saw in the in in the webinar and things because that that's taken a long time to get people like that to think about it sometimes it's because they're in that it's their personal situation as well which is helping Yes, and I guess linked to this is, and I can see a few hands up and we will be taking questions in the last 10 minutes. Um, but I guess linked to that is the idea about um, 
what constitutes evidence and Clinton's already said you know there's there's biases in research and in gathering information we have to be very honest about that and be open about that but I think it's also useful to see where we currently are what's the baseline so what pol what policies currently exist on intersectionality and the issues um if, if people could talk specifically about policies that they're aware of that would be helpful um but also um some other things that are coming through the chat when are we going to address doing meaningful assessments of all groups? So does being authentically person-centred reveal the issues? And I think this is where it links to evidence from peer support groups, so peer-to-peer -peer interactions, keeping it authentic to what's happening on the ground um, versus the information that actually is being gathered, um, you know, inofficially, uh, in, in inverted commas, um, versus uh, doing genuine co-production with people. What does that look like? What can that look like to inform the services that are going to have to be created to deal with some of the issues that we're talking about? Um, and then another thought is, if 25% of adults without ch aging, ad people aging without children end up in care, what does that tell us about quality outcomes and choices? How empowering are our options? So you have to think about where people are going, where they're ending up, and then, you know, versus is self-directed support actually happening for these groups of people? Um, I'm just wondering if, so we're gonna start the Q&A in about 10 minutes. So I can see lots of hands going up. We'd encourage you to put specific questions in the chat um, or thoughts arising from what we're actually talking about. Um, I wondered if there was anything specific that um, Clinton and Jason wanted to pick up about. Um, so we've already picked up this need for accurate data. Uh, whose data? Who, who's informing that data collection? Um, something about awareness and engagement and something about in, in gathering the full picture of how intersectionality is affecting people aging without children, how we look at um, things like peer support, um, and advocacy, but I want to pick up this idea about communities and something that I saw come up in the chat. Um, it, excuse me, it's run so quickly. Um, it, here it is. So we need stronger communities, full stop. People looking out for each other benefits everyone, um, aging without children or not. The big challenge is making sure people are allowed to become, are not allowed to become invisible and overlooked. Not everyone will need or want help or support, but it should be there for those who do want and need it. So there's a wide question here about the role of community and what we mean by that. I wondered if Clinton had any thoughts on that, and then we'll come to Jason. Even the term community sometimes is really hard to define. People talk about community as a place, a neighbourhood, you know. Uh, 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 also, people talk about community as, as um, you know, um, community of interest. That could be online. It could be uh, uh, peer support groups. I'm um, I'm attached to quite a, a lot of different peer support groups, but I call that my community of interest. That gives me that sense of belonging to try and understand my um my intersectionality of identities as a, a black disabled person but also understanding those different cultural uh, elements that uh, and societal uh, norms that can um pull me apart as a, as an individual so that overlay for intersectionality and especially aging without uh, children we need to discuss and unpick what does a sense of belonging mean? Because that's what community for, for me is. And how do we use co-design, co-production to look at the uh, the here and now and what the future might be uh, for, you know, policy development uh, 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 practice and for, for people and individuals, uh, especially if we're talking about caring about each other. What does that actually mean? What are the things that we and society and systemically need to do? And I think I'd add to that a piece of research I was involved with at Mind, which was looking at peer support in marginalised groups. 
um, the experience of people who experience multiple disadvantages, they found that mainstream peer support services were quite racist places, and they use that word not lightly. Um, they defined themselves as only um, coming into a sense of community when they were around people who understood multiple levels of, of disadvantage. So people who were had mental, uh, you know, for example, a HIV men's group of made up of people of colour. Um, they described kind of mainstream services as kind of places of quite um, quite oppressed, oppressing spaces, people where they felt lack of understanding and only in smaller um, peer support spaces that specialised with these intersections, they found a sense of belonging. Um, there were problems around funding for these kinds of um, groups where people could come together and have a sense of belonging. So I wondered if there is something there about who decides where the money goes and how do we create services that kind of speak to uh, people who experience multiple levels of dis disadvantage. Um, Jason, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would, I would, I, I would agree with both what you've just said and what what Clinton said. I think there, but the 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 practical challenge. Well, I and from coming from the AWOC perspective, though, it, it's sort of like okay, but this further compounds. So you've got those different groups or different people with different identities that are have multiple kinds of things, and then this AWOC thing isn't even necessarily. Re um, recognized, but also that it is implicit in the care, health and social care that there are adults, not necessarily your children, but people who will advocate for you. But the challenge is also that in, if I go into the hospital tomorrow, unless it's very clear uh, somewhere in writing and some my doctor and someone else knows, my friend is not going to be able to come in and advocate for me, I, my, my husband or my child or my mother or father. And that's still a challenge is, is how do we square that a bit because that, that, that's often an issue and that's a, a huge concern for people. But also it is the thing about thinking about, or we need to think about proactively planning in a way that's not scary. We need to think about this without, because people, when people are scared about something, they tend to shy away from doing it. Um, and that's been a big issue, I think, in most of the peer groups that we work with as well, that they're trying to help each other. And they're saying, this is, we can do things. These are the things we can do. These are the, but there are still blocks. But that that's something that I think practically also we need to, it's okay to talk about these things, but that's not seen in policy and practice very much. Um, and I, I, I just seen yeah, a couple of comments in the groups is that where these things are even become more even complex, it, it becomes even harder. Thank you, Jason. All right, let's move on to the Q&A then just in the last kind of eight or nine minutes of the chat. So um, I wondered if Ian could help, Ian from TLAP who's fielding the cute questions and I can see some hands up. So um, I wonder if it's okay if we just launch straight into the hands I can see. Um, and we'll take just a couple of questions before we get booted out in about eight minutes. Um, I think the first hand I saw was Peter Atkins. Do you have a question, Peter? We could unmute Peter Atkins, or if Ian could see a chat from, a question from Peter in the chat. Yeah, could I encourage people to use the chat because it's not possible to unmute? Okay. okay. So, um, Peter, if you want to um, highlight your question in the chat, and again, same same for you, Sue. Um, I think one of the, the points to reflect from the chat is, is just the sense that this can happen at any age and at any time. Um, and that a number of people have mentioned that being quite young and not thinking at all about requiring care or support or, or anything to, to manage needs just for a, a sports injury, if you haven't got that network around you um how um that can, can you know overnight and life can change within a matter of hours um how might we pick that up so again i think clinton jason is is any sense in terms of the challenge that that presents um policy but also uh, local support i think probably connects back to the the wider points around community um as well um and there's also a question about what policies currently exist on intersectionality and the issue. So I guess that's a broader issue around how well do we think the current policy even addresses or understands issues around intersectionality. Um, so we'll probably start with those two and see where see where it takes us. If, if we look at if we look at policy just around intersectionality within the spaces of care and support. 
our systems that we currently have, we have created silo uh, provision. And what I mean by that is we have created provision around single identity, either physical disability, learning disability, older people, uh, 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 learning disability, and so on. So we end up binary thinking. We don't actually, even though we use the, the words and terms of uh, person-centred care and support, we are actually looking in a binary thinking of seeing people not as a whole person. That has implications if we want to um, close the, um, the, the, the challenges systematically. We're not systematically thinking about um, uh, the, the issues around how do we do needs assessment? How does needs assessment play out in uh, care and support? How does policy development play out in care and support around intersectionality and ageing without children? But it's also about, for me, what is the training and education you know, for professionals, but also for the community, you know, to understand some of the uh, uh, challenges that are going on. But also, does that mean we have to change our service de uh, delivery model? You know, what's that uh, going to look like? And also for me, it's about how do we uh, community build to create stronger communities, whether that's a community of place or community of interest, around, you know, um, changing the value of caring about each other. Jason, did you want to add to that? Um, no, I'd, let's go with the next level of grad. I can't think of anything specific. I, I would agree, um, but let's let a couple more questions and just so we have a chance. Yeah, I just think that Helen's echoed that in the chat where she said massive culture change is needed, practitioners, and if you think more broadly around niche creative support that's available, you know, not just a few calls a day. So I think there is a, a massive culture change that kind of we could be mm. supporting and making recommendations and spearheading as a as a result of this kind of conversation. Um, I'm just going to read out Sue's chat. She's had her hand up yep. um, patiently throughout, throughout today's session. Thank and you. So I just want to make sure Sue's point gets heard. Um, so it's saying, right, I'm Sue, white lesbian, aging without children, atheist, vegan campaigner, now deal with me. Um, that's what I want those that make decisions to grasp. We need to be clear and open about myriad aspects of intersectionality that permeate society. Social services need to be hugely invested in and revamped. P.S. All aging without children groups need to be absolutely open door to everyone. So and, yeah, and link to that. In there. Lots in there and linked to that Sue and Anne who are AWOC in York have said we need to fall over backwards to say and make clear on all our publicity and online messages that everyone from every culture, disability, faith, LGBT community is welcome at AWOC peer support groups around the country. So I think it's that we have a role in kind of opening it out and ensuring everything's inclusive as well. Um, I can see Sue and Anne. Oh, I can see both on the screen now. Yeah. <laughs> Great, they've got their hands up, lovely. Um, and Sue has also said, we've learnt more about transitions from being a young person to becoming an adult, yet the period... So this is about transition from being a young person to an older person. So there's something here about transitions. Um, maybe from 18 to 180 is seen as one period of just retirement in the middle. Do we need to focus more on transitions throughout adult life? I'm experiencing how I'm now seen less as a disabled person and more as an older person. And this is reinforced by systems, especially benefits, which again, I think speaks to Clinton's point about seeing that kind of silo thinking, factoring, creating services and provision in terms of one thing at a time rather than a whole person and a whole picture. And I think transitions is, is also echoing that. Great. Okay, just two minutes left. Um, just wondering, Ian, is there anything else we should pick up or summarize? Just on that point, Kate, you yeah. just mentioned, uh, the elephant in the room for, for, for me is how we go about addressing the power imbalance, because Sue's um, question for me, systematically, we have structures that don't uh, um, address the power imbalance. 
to hearing, uh, listening and hearing from diverse voices. We still do one size fits all, even though our rhetoric says we address one size fits all, but the experience of people who draw on care and support says otherwise. And my experience is that co-production can be a way of um, resetting that power imbalance so when it's done right. That is a, a solution to what you've just described, Clinton, when it's done well. Um, and I just want to sh uh, shout out to some potential good practice in Shropshire, Telford and Reeking. They're doing some good work around ageing LGBT plus people and some of the organs organisations they're working with can see the relevance for other protected characteristics and increasingly are getting intersectionality. So I wonder if we could share a link there sal uh, at lgbtsand.com with everybody that might be a good practice for us to check out um, and a big thank you to Gus as well Dr Gus Subero making some quite good comments if there's any links that you want to share Gus please do so in the chat and we can pass them on we've got 30 seconds left mm. and I'm determined to use every second Jason did you want to yes. add anything yeah I would just I'd echo a little bit what I said before is, is yeah that's why we're counting different groups we need to make sure that we count a walk we ask those questions are because then if we, if we know more then we can do more and also i think there's there's something more also we need to think about how do we do um, later life planning and advanced planning for certain things like this and that is recognized so that that some of these challenges can 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 be practically overcome but if it's not if it's not counted we don't know and that's been a big a big issue for us Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. We're about to be booted out. Thanks for a brilliant discussion. See you back in the main room.